This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome back to this lecture on thermal unit operations. We are still in this large uh, chapter on distillation and rectification. And today we want to deal with the feed stage. So what did we see in the last videos? We saw that uh, we can derive operating lines for the rectifying and stripping, stripping sections that are straight lines in the YX diagram and with those we can describe, well, the result of balances which describe the compositions of the streams that meet in between the theoretical stages. And we know that we can plot the steps between the operating lines and the equilibrium curve in order to depict the theoretical stages throughout more or less the entire column. The only point that was open was the question, what is the second point of the stripping line? For the rectifying line, we had two points, we could plot that. For the stripping line, we realize that we have one point on the diagonal at xb, but we left it open uh, how the second point had to be derived. And we still have to do that. So there are two questions. And the, the one question is simply how do the two parts fit together? And apparently, well, how do they fit together? We can directly say that, I mean, in principle, we know that they meet, the two parts meet at the feed stage. So the feed somehow has to be involved in these considerations. And so the second question is, how does the feed state influence how these two operating lines meet, how they come together? And actually, in this video, I would like to focus on that. How does the feed state influence that? And we have to, of course, keep in mind that the feed can have any thermal state and I especially refer to this thermal state. The feed can be a saturated liquid, it can be a vapor at its dew point, so also in a saturated state, it can be a two-phase mixture, it can be superheated steam or subcooled liquid. These are the possibilities that are available in principle, if you do not consider solids, which you usually don't. So, how does that influence really what is going on? In order to derive the influence of the feed at that level, we have to set up balances and to see what that leads to. How the different things at the feed stage, how they interact, so to speak. In order to set up the balances, we again have to define a control volume. And this time we want to define the control volume exactly around that stage that is of relevance for us, which is exactly the feed stage. So we want to balance the flow rates around the feed. And there we have actually different things that enter and leave the stage, uh, the feed stage. It's the feed, of course, that is entering with its composition XFI and with its molar enthalpy HF. Since the feed stage is sort of defined, we can determine the HF and depending on the thermal stage, uh, state, the HF will differ. If it's a saturated liquid, it will be the liquid enthalpy in saturation. It's a vapor in the dew point, then it's a saturated vapor enthalpy. So this enthalpy depends on temperature and that means also on the thermal state because of course temperature relates in this multi-component mixture directly to the thermal state of the feed. So this represents the thermal state, the state of the feed, or temperature, whichever way you like it. So as the temperature increases, for example, for the feed set, if you look different possibilities, then you see that also the HF will increase correspondingly. Then we have entering flow rates, which is the liquid stream coming from, from above. Since we number our stage, states, stages from top to bottom, this is n minus 1. And there you see already that I want to skip the f, because if I would write nf everywhere, then it would get a little bit too tedious and too complicated, and it actually doesn't help. We want to focus on the feed, so I leave 
the, the F and I don't uh, write it, but we know we always refer to the NF in this lecture if we call it N. Anyway, the liquid is coming from the stage above, carrying the stage index NF-1 or in short just N-1. The uh, entering flow rate from below is a G dot prime. It's a stripping section flow rate, so it carries a prime. And the index is NF plus 1 or actually N plus 1. And of course, here we also have the different enthalpies and we want to assume, as we did in the derivation of the equimolar evaporation and condensation, that we can assume that liquid and vapor both are ideal mixtures. That is, that we don't have to account for excess enthalpies. This in turn means that we can determine the molar enthalpy by just summing up the mole fraction times the molar enthalpies of the individual components, of course, in the corresponding state. So here in the vapor state and there in the liquid state. So just the sum over xi times hi summed over all components is the molar enthalpy of the flow rate. L dot and G dot if we here it's a vapor enthalpy and that's a liquid enthalpy. Of course liquid and vapor always in saturated state. Okay, we have of course also streams that are leaving the state stage that we are regarding. It's a L dot prime and the G dot. And since our nomenclature is such that the leaving streams carry the index of the stage they are leaving, this is a Yn and this is an Xn. And of course, also here we have the molar enthalpies of the pure components and we have to multiply them with the corresponding mole fractions yn and xn, which of course differ from these mole fractions. That's the effect of distillation, the purification effect. So summing all yni times hiv give, gives the overall molar enthalpy of this g dot stream. Same holds down here. Having discussed that, we want to look uh, how we can set up the balances. And we want to set up three balances, we again have to consider the energy balance uh, in this special case. So how do we do that? Well, feed stage. You want to set up the balance exactly for the control volume I have sh shown before. We again want to assume that we are in steady state, which means that the left side of the balance, the, of the equal sign of the balance, is zero. No change with time, no accumulation in, within the control volume. So zero equals. And the first balance you want to write is actually uh, the balance for the overall flow rates. So zero equals what is entering. That is, of course, the F dot. And we saw also that from above it's an L dot. From below, a G dot prime was entering, so plus G dot prime, minus the flow rates leaving the stage, and that was liquid stream and a vapor stream. Let me first write the vapor stream. It's a G dot minus the L dot prime. So that is the balance for the overall flow rates. The second balance you want to set up is that for an individual component, that is the flow rate of that individual component. Again, everything is in steady state, so left side of the equal sign is zero, zero equals. And now we know that we have to multiply simply the flow rates with the corresponding mole fractions. So it's times xfi plus the L dot times the... Now we have to check which was it. It was coming from above, so it's an xn minus one of component i plus g dot prime coming from below, so it was a y n plus one i minus a g dot, and now the leaving streams, of course, carry the index of the, compo of the stage they are leaving, so it's the xn, so x, uh, of course, uh, y in that case, y n i minus l dot prime x n i. So that is the balance for the flow rates of component i. The next balance is that for energy. Again, steady state, so the left side of the equal sign is zero. And I will have to write a little bit more narrow so that everything fits into one line. 
Okay. Zero equals. Of course, we have again the feed that is entering, and that simply is the f dot times the it's a mole, uh, molar flow rate times the molar enthalpy of that feed that characterizes the thermal state of the feed, which is just hf. And we cannot simplify that because we don't know the thermal state. We want to leave that open. So it's just some hf that characterizes the thermal state of the feed. Plus. And now we realize actually that we have to multiply the flow rates with the molar enthalpies of each flow rate. The molar enthalpy of the flow rate we discussed in the slide before, that that is just the summation over all components of the corresponding mole fraction times the molar enthalpy of the pure component in the corresponding state. So HIL or HIV depending if we regard a vapor or a liquid flow rate. And since all these four terms contain the summation over all components, we can write one big sum, so to speak. So we use one summation sign, so it's summation over all components, i equals 1 to k, over all k components, times, and now come the different individual contributions of the individual components, so a big bracket, and that is now for the L dot, it's just the L dot, x n minus 1 i times h i l. And you see directly that this is the summation over, well, L dot doesn't carry an index, so it's actually L dot times the summation of these two terms over all components, and that's exactly the molar enthalpy of that flow rate in the liquid state. Plus the g dot prime times the corresponding mole fraction, y n plus 1 i, times the corresponding enthalpy, and that is now the h i in the vapor state, minus the g dot times the y n i, times again the enthalpy of component a in the vapor state, minus l dot prime times x n i, times the h i in the liquid state. And that is, of course, uh, of course, I have to close the brackets, and that's the balance for the energy. And we see that if you look at the individual contributions, you have the summation over these terms, and they, of course, are always the flow rate times the molar enthalpy of that flow rate in its corresponding state, so in the vapor state, etc., et saturation, or of the liquid state, etc. saturation. Okay, and now we have to do something with these equations, and what we actually do is that we uh, want to substitute this, these two terms with the help of the equation above. We see that we have here actually the g dot prime times y n plus 1 i minus the g dot times y n, both multiplied with the molar enthalpy of component i in the vapor state. So we can collect, so to speak, the flow rates times mole fractions, and both have to multiply be multiplied by the HIV. And we realize that we exactly have these two terms in the equation above, in here. So we can solve this equation for these two terms, substitute what we obtain in the equation above, just multiplying that, what we get from here, with the HIV. And then we will see what we will be winding up with. So if we want to use this equation and solve it for this difference, what do we get? Well, we get g dot prime times y n plus 1 i minus the g dot times y n i equals, and now we bring all the rest to the other side of the equal sign, so this is the positive term, so it's an l dot prime times x n i minus the f dot x f i minus the l dot times x n minus 1 i. And now we substitute these two in here, both terms are here multiplied by the HIV, so we have to multiply these three expressions with the HIV. And that's exactly what we want to do now. And as always, I have mentioned that already previously, if we do such a derivation in between, it may become a little bit more lengthy, a little bit tedious, but if we do everything properly, then that will collapse later on and we will wind up with a simple equation, and that's actually exactly the case here as well if we do everything properly, of course. So if we substitute that, what do we obtain? Zero equals. 
we can't do anything about the f dot times hf plus the summation over all components i equals 1 to k times l dot x n minus 1 i h i l then there comes the substitution the next two terms are substituted so we have to write plus l dot prime x n i but all these terms now have to be multiplied as we have discussed before by h i v yeah, because we substitute something which carries this h i v minus f dot x f i h i v minus l dot x n minus 1 i h i v so with that with these three terms we have substituted these two terms in here with the help of this equation and now comes the last term here so it is a minus l dot prime x n i times h i and this is an h i l of the liquid the next thing that we can do, let's scroll down a little bit, the next thing that we can do is we can realize that we have two terms with the identical flow rates. It's an L dot here, L dot there. Also the compositions are the same and here we have an HIL and here an HIV. The difference of that is of course exactly, well if you write it HIV minus HIL, it's the enthalpy of vaporization. Same holds for this L dot prime. Here we have the plus with the HIV minus the term for HIL. So it's again the enthalpy of vaporization. And there we realize already that we have a good chance to simplify things. But let's do that step for step. And I always uh, suggest to do better one more equation, write down a little bit more and not make any errors by doing things in your head. So let's simply write it down. 0 equals. We again can't do anything about the f dot hf. We will see later how that works. Plus the summation over all com k components times. And now we want to collect what we have in between. We want in, in the brackets we want to have the hiv minus hil. And if we look at this uh, l dot, we have of course this as a negative. So we have a minus minus l dot x n minus 1 i times h i v minus h i l. So this uh, is this term and that term. The two other terms with an l dot, well l dot prime actually, it is this one and that one. h i v has a positive sign so we can say plus l dot prime times x n i times h i v minus h i l and then comes the last term in this line which is this minus f dot x f h i v minus f dot x f i h i v of course we should not forget the closing brackets and then we realize actually that this is delta h v and that is delta HV as well. That means that is the enthalpy of vaporization, the molar enthalpy of vaporization. And we already have discussed that that should not carry an index I because assuming for this derivation of the, for the Mecaptile diagram, we assume that that is identical for all components, so we don't have to indicate that, uh, that for the individual component. Well, if we substitute that, we actually realize there's only one term left over that carries the index of the component so we can pull everything else in front of the individual uh, summation so now we want to split the summation into three, three individual terms and uh, place everything that doesn't carry an i an index i in front of that summation so what do we get then A zero equals well, we still can't do anything about the f dot h hf you will see that in just a moment what to do with that minus L dot delta H V times the summation over all components I 1 to K times the X N minus 1 I plus the L dot prime times delta H V times the summation over all components I 1 to K X N I minus the sum well first of all we have the F dot 
And then we have the summation over all components, i equals 1 to k, x, f, i, h, i, v. We don't have any brackets anymore, so that's fine. And now, of course, you will tell me directly, well, the summation over all ball fractions for a given stream, that's unity. That's unity as well. So we can simplify that further, and what we obtain is uh, a zero equals, and let's regroup that a little bit. Uh, at that point, uh, it is an f dot h f minus f dot summation over all components i equals 1 to k x f i h i v. What to do with the rest? Um, it's uh, plus an L dot prime minus L dot times delta H V. Is that correct? Yes, I guess so. Okay. So what to do now? The next thing is that we want to um, separate the different uh, variables, and if we do that, we can. Well, we want to have that on the one side hand side of the equal sign. So we have want to have l dot prime minus l dot times delta h v equals the rest. So we bring these two terms to the other side. So this is now the positive and then the negative one. So we have f dot times and we collect the rest, so to speak, in separate brackets, uh, summation over all components, i equals 1 to k, x, f, i, h, i, v, minus h, f. And now we want to solve that in a, a specific way. We want to solve that for l dot prime minus l dot divided by f dot. So we want to get the relative flow rate, so to speak, and that, that is the relative difference of the uh, liquid flow rates in the rectifying and the stripping section divided by the feed flow rate, relative to the feed flow rate. And that is exactly summation over all components, x, f, i, h, i, v, minus h, f, divided by delta h, v. And that actually we want to define as a specific variable and we want to call that Q. This is a quite important equation and because of that we want to give it a bracket. It goes like that, so that is our bracketed equation. That is quite important. And actually what does that describe? What is Q like? What does Q describe especially? So Q equals, and I would like to express that in, in words, so to speak. What does it describe? Well, on the one hand side, we have here the enthalpy that the feed would have if it were in saturated vapor state. It has a composition of the feed, and they are multiplied, the individual mole fractions are multiplied by the molar enthalpies in the saturated vapor state. So this overall is the enthalpy that the feed would have if it were just evaporated into, well, at dew point conditions. And this is the enthalpy of the feed, the molar enthalpy of the feed in its thermal state at which it is entering into the column. So this difference actually is that energy or that enthalpy that you need to add to the feed in order to convert it exactly into the vapor state at dew point. So that's the enthalpy you need, or the energy you need, to evaporate, to just evaporate the feed. And that is divided by the enthalpy of vaporization. So we can rewrite that, and we can say Q equals, in words, it's the heat for converting the feed into saturated vapor divided by the enthalpy of vaporization.
Okay, so far so good. So this is something that of course describes also the thermal state of the feet, apparently. Okay, that defines more or less the feed state. So if we know the feed state, the thermal state of the feed, we also know the enthalpy of vaporization, then we are able to determine the Q. So Q is something that should be specified. It defines the thermal state of the feed more or less, or from the thermal state of the feed you can derive the Q. So it has to be known because you can only design a process if you know what is entering and if, or if you also know the thermal state of what is entering, of course. So you have to know it if you want to design a distillation column. So this is a known property for any design purpose. So Q is known. And then what do we learn? We can now solve this equation with the help of the Q and rewrite it in a more or less trivial way. And we get L dot prime minus L dot equals Q times F dot. Well, what does this tell us? We learn something. We learn that the difference in the flow rates between stripping and rectifying section of the column is exactly this Q times the F dot. So now we know how the flow rates of the stripping and the rectifying section, how they relate. We didn't know that before. We learned that by setting up these balances. And of course we can do a similar thing also for the vapor flow rate, but before that let me just solve that directly for the uh, L dot prime. We can write it also directly. L dot prime equals L dot plus Q times F dot. And then we want to rewrite the same thing also for the vapor flow rates. For that we actually need the last balance we didn't use so far. And it's exactly this uh, balance. And there we see that we now of course know this difference. L dot minus L dot prime. We can substitute that and then so to speak solve for the remaining uh, G dot difference. And if uh, let me just directly rewrite this overall balance before, before we substitute that. The equation was 0 equals F dot plus L dot plus G dot prime minus G dot minus L dot prime. And now we substitute the for the L dot prime. So we have a 0 equals F dot plus, and as I said, always prefer writing one more equation but doing less errors by doing everything as if you were doing everything by head in your head. So it's a you have to simply rewrite the things and then we simply substitute the L dot prime by L dot. It has a minus sign, so minus Q F dot. And that we can solve also for the, uh, well now, now the, the L dot cancels here. We see that plus minus L dot and now we can solve for the G dot prime minus G dot. So G dot prime minus G dot equals what is remaining. Well, it is a both have an F dot and we have actually a Q minus one. There we did something in our head. We brought these two terms to the other side. So this is positive. Now this is negative, positive Q minus one. So that's what we get. And of course we can uh, solve that also, write this also for the G dot prime. G dot prime equals G dot plus F dot times Q minus 1. And actually we can also have some boxes for these two equations that define the difference between the flow rates in the rectifying and the stripping section or define the stripping section based on the flow rates in the rectifying section, whichever way you want, you want to write it. And you see that actually the feed, if you interpret that, you see that the feed is split up uh, a certain fraction is split up into going into the uh, liquid and another fraction sub, uh, being added to the vapor flow rate. We will actually see that later if we set up general balances for the moment that uh, is sufficient at that point. Now I would like to discuss the different, different possibilities we, what we have. We saw that actually the Q is the heat that we need to convert the feed just into a saturated, uh, saturated vapor divided by the enthalpy of vaporization. Which possibilities do we have? Which values can this Q actually take? And so let's have a look at that. And here these things are collected, so to speak. On the one hand side we have this difference, 
for the enthalpy, that is, this is the energy, the heat that we need to add to the feed in order to just convert that into a saturated vapor. Let's look at different possibilities here. The easiest thing is actually if the feed is already in saturated vapor state, then we don't have to do anything. No heat needs to be added. This difference up here is exactly zero. If on the other hand side the feed is saturated liquid, hmm, then we of course exactly have to add the enthalpy of vaporization in order to evaporate it into the saturated vapor state. So this is exactly delta HV. If we have a subcooled liquid, we first have to heat it up into the saturated liquid state and then have to evaporate it. That means that the enthalpy to convert the feed into the saturated vapor state is more than the enthalpy of vaporization. If we have a two-phase system, then of course the enthalpy or heat that we have to add is somewhere in between the two boundary cases between the saturated and the saturated liquid. That is this heat that we have to add is positive but less than del delta HV. And if we have actually superheated vapor, well in that case we actually have to cool down. We have to withdraw heat, we have to cool it down. So the added heat is negative in that case. The Q behaves correspondingly. We simply have to divide these things by the enthalpy of vaporization. In this case it's simple it's one, in that case it's a zero. The remaining uh, options of course behave correspondingly, so this is q is larger than one. Here it has to, between, has to be between the two limiting cases, between zero and one, and here of course the q is negative as well. So with that we learned one of the two questions we had in the beginning. We learned how the thermal state of the feed, the specific state of the feed in the design um, uh, task that we actually have at hand, how that influences the ratio or the relation between the flow rates in the stripping and the rectifying section. So that's one of the bases. And so we see that the thermal state of the feed can be captured by this parameter Q. It actually corresponds to that. If you know either of them, you always can, can uh, describe the other one in principle. So knowing the Q, you can also determine in principle the temperature. Of course, you need thermodynamic functions for that, the enthalpies, but in principle that's possible. Or the other way around, if you know the temperature with the help of the thermodynamic functions, you are able to determine the Q. And that is exactly the ratio of the energy required to evaporate the feed and the enthalpy of vaporization. Okay, with that we have answered one of the questions and we have regarded the feed stage with that. I would like to finish at this point. Next video we want to look at the second question we had at the beginning. I hope I see you again then. Thank you very much.